not doing anything. Did you just want to say more about the model? Yeah, please. Hatred and jealousy. Love and loyalty. That's the full range of attitudes that we see on display in our story this morning. From, from Saul's insane hatred to Jonathan's deeply, loved felt, uh, deeply felt love and friendship, all in response to the same person, David. Now, some people evoke very different reactions from different people. They're like Marmite. I don't know if you know anyone like that. Some people love them, others hate them. Um, I don't know what you... I, I had some honey on toast this morning and some marmite on toast as well. And um, marmite on toast, sometimes it's lovely and this morning it tasted horrible. Um, <laughs> um, but some people love them, others hate them. In such cases, I guess they have a, a personality which rubs some people up the wrong way, but which inspires love and loyalty in others. But in today's passage, we see a different situation. It wasn't David himself that evoked those different reactions. He himself was loved by all. But we see a situation where these very different attitudes are rooted ultimately not in David's personality, but in the bearer's attitude towards God and the coming of his kingdom. In, in the story so far, we've heard how Saul, who'd been appointed as Israel's first king, had rebelled against God and been rejected as king by the Lord, although he remained in position. We've heard how Samuel secretly anointed David as the next king and how David, trusting in the living God, had gone out against the Philistine giant Goliath and won a great victory. And that's where we are at the start of chapter 18. So I want to look at these chapters under three headings. Firstly, and fairly briefly, David, God's champion. Secondly, Saul, hatred and jealousy. And lastly, Jonathan, love and loyalty. So we'll make a, a start straight away. Um, firstly, we see David, God's champion. I don't know if you can see in the corner there, Stephen said to me he hadn't been able to find a a picture of um, David with Goliath's head and then he admitted it was actually because it was too gory for people but <laughs> I, I couldn't help thinking of Caravaggio's painting um, earlier Goliath had seemed an unbeatable problem for Israel and the land was in danger of being overrun by the Philistines but in David God had raised up a great champion of faith here was one who was possessed by a burning concern for the glory of Israel's God, an unflinching faith in his promises and a steady dependence on his spirit. Everyone rejoiced to see what God's grace had brought about through David. And David gained immediate popularity. He became a national hero overnight, an instant celebrity. As a result of his success against Goliath, he was lionised by all Israel. Um, and next, please. <coughs> Think of Emma Raducanu, Raducanu after her victory in the US Open singles at the age of 17. All the press were queuing up to interview her and companies everywhere wanted to sponsor her or get her endorsement for their products. Royalty congratulated her. Pictures of her face sold newspapers and she won the BBC Sports Personality of the Year. Hands down, no contest. And I guess it was a bit like that for David here. And his fame didn't stop with that first great victory. Israel's champion went wherever Saul sent him in loyal submission. He submitted to Saul's authority and God gave him success in everything he did. Verse 5. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him, so that Saul set, set him over the men of war. And this was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. And verse 30. 
The commanders of the Philistines came out to battle, and as often as they came out, David had more success than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was highly esteemed. Indeed, um, and next please. In, indeed, the whole situation is summed up in verse 14. And David had success in all his undertakings, for the Lord was with him. Hope you, you noticed that. David had great success, for the Lord was with him. As the Lord's anointed, he enjoyed the favour of God, just as Saul had done at an earlier stage. Unlike Saul, David didn't reject God's ways. He was zealous in every way for the glory of God. But this faithfulness didn't only bring him success. It was this same faithfulness to God that was to bring him many years of suffering as he fled from Saul's hatred and persecution. Following Christ, walking with God, will not always bring us unalloyed happiness and earthly blessing in this life. That's the fallacy of the health and wealth prosperity gospel. But if we're faithful in following Christ, it may arouse opposition and hatred for many who feel threatened by our faith and the salvation we rejoice in. But you know what? It's worth it. The, the blessings of Christ far outweigh anything this world has to offer and will easily compensate for anything we lose due to this world's hostility. I think there's that question where uh, Jesus' disciples ask him, what will you do for us who have followed you? And um, he talks about uh, them receiving a hundredfold. And I think... I'll if I remember rightly, a hundredfold, I think, is 10,000%. It's a massive investment, a massive return on, on, on any investment um, that you could make. <coughs> God will easily compensate for anything that we lose due to this world's hostility. Um, David will lose his earthly security, his good name, his wife, his place in society. He's forced to flee and take refuge in the desert, always staying one step ahead of Saul. But God will protect and preserve him from every attack. And at the right time, his purposes will be fulfilled. And in the meantime, God will prepare him through his experiences. The Lord could have clicked his fingers, as it were, uh, removing Saul straight away and instantly acclaiming David as king. But he didn't. There was a school of experience, a school of hard knocks, which David needed to go through first. But in the midst of his trials and tribulations, David would learn to rely on his God and write many of the wonderful psalms which so enrich our faith and spiritual life today. The Lord was with David and if we're trusting in Jesus Christ, then he's with us also, whatever struggles we may go through. May we always look to him as David did. So firstly, we've seen David, God's champion. And then secondly, we see Saul, hatred and jealousy. We've already noticed the fame and popularity which David won in the aftermath of his battle with Goliath. But in the midst of all this adulation of David, the seeds of insecurity and jealousy were sown in Saul's heart and they would produce a tragic harvest. You might have thought Saul would have rejoiced in God's blessing upon David, which had delivered the nation, but he didn't. Instead of rejoicing over what, had, over what God had done for him and, and the nation through David, Saul despised and detested David so much that he sought to kill him. Remember, David had done nothing to deserve such treatment. He'd walked with God, and God had used him mightily. That was all. Surely David's success should have pleased God, should have pleased Saul. 
but instead he was filled with jealousy. Verse 6, as they were coming home, when David uh, returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing, to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, and with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated. Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very angry, and this saying displeased him. And Saul eyed David from that day on. Well, I, I guess this is something we should all be able to relate to. Which of us has never felt jealous of someone else who appears to be more blessed than we are? You may think, well, I've never been jealous of anybody, anyone else. Really? You only have to watch two babies playing happily on the floor. Suddenly one baby spots what the other has got and he wants it. And bam, he takes it and the tears start. <coughs> it's a basic part of human nature, of our fallen human nature. We may not always be so blatant in adulthood. For many of us, jealousies are more subtle. But if we truly examine ourselves, we will surely find them. And yet how childish and destructive this emotion is. In his book, uh, Knowing God... Jim Packer says, vicious jealousy is an expression of the attitude, I want what you've got and I hate you because I haven't got it. It's an infantile resentment springing from unmortified covetousness which expresses itself in envy, malice and meanness of action. It's terribly potent for it feeds and is fed by pride, the taproot of our fallen nature. There is a mad obsessiveness about jealousy which, if indulged, can tear an otherwise, otherwise firm character to shreds. Wrath is cruel. Anger is overwhelming. But who can stand before jealousy? That's Proverbs 27, verse 4. Uh, as someone else has said, jealousy is the raw material for murder. And we see that the, the very next day, in um, verse 10. The next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre as he did day by day. David had his spear in his hand and, and Saul hurled the spear. Sorry, Saul had his spear in his hand. And Saul hurled the spear for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David evaded him twice. Jealousy can lead to murder. Not only that, but jealousy does great harm to those who <coughs> harbour it. And Saul was very angry, verse 8. Literally, the Hebrew word chara me, here means to burn within. Saul was on a slow burn. One writer says, envy is a coal that comes hissing hot from hell. Um, William Penn says the jealous, the jealous are troublesome to others but a torment to themselves Thomas Fuller says envy shoots at others and wounds herself envy never enriched any man envy eats nothing but its own heart verse 12 tells us that Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him but had departed from Saul I think that's where we get to the heart of Saul's jealousy. Deep down, Saul knew why everything was going wrong for him and right for David, because he'd alienated himself from the Lord while David enjoyed God's favour. But that knowledge didn't drive him to genuine, rep genuine repentance, but only to hate David all the more. And we need to examine ourselves here, because at its root... Envy is a rejection of God's sovereign right to bless others differently to us. And this kind of envy can poison our lives. It can even affect our spiritual service. I don't know if you've ever heard of Henry Varley. Varley was the preacher who famously said to D.L. Moody, 
The world has yet to see what God will do with a man who is fully committed to him. It was a statement that so challenged Moody that he resolved to be that man. And uh, it had world-changing results uh, as he became a great uh, evangelist around the world. But what isn't so well known is that Varley was himself a powerful evangelist and pastor. But in his biography, he, he tells us that one of, the most, one of his most difficult battles concerned his jealousy of another preacher. A, a neighbourhood pastor began drawing some of Varley's church members and Varley felt deep resentment towards the man. Later he admitted... I shall never forget the sense of guilt and sin that possessed me over that business. I was miserable. Was I practically saying to the Lord Jesus, unless the prosperity of your church and people comes in this neighbourhood by me, success had better not come? Was I really showing inability to rejoice in another worker's service? I felt that it was a sin of a very hateful character. I never asked the Lord to take away my life either before or since. But I did then, unless his grace would give me victory over this foul sin of jealousy. Wonder whether uh, the foul sin of jealousy has any place in our hearts. Uh, again, the, the famous Scottish pastor Andrew Bonar once wrote in his diary, This day, 20 years ago, I preached for the first time as an ordained minister. It's amazing that the Lord has spared me and used me at all. I have no reason to wonder that he used others far more than he does me. Yet envy is my hurt. And today I have been seeking grace to rejoice exceedingly in the usefulness of others, even when it cast me into the shade. Lord, take this envy from me. I wonder if you're able to rejoice exceedingly in the usefulness of others, even when it casts you into the shade. Maybe there's someone who you feel is less spiritually minded than you and yet they've been preferred for an area of ministry. They've been given more opportunities to serve and they seem to receive all the plaudits, all the praise and you're hurting because of it. But who are you to judge whether you are more spiritually minded or gifted than them? And even if you are, remember that it's all of grace anyway. May the Lord set us free from all envy, which only serves to harm ourselves, and give us grace to rejoice with those who are blessed in the Lord's service. Wherever God blesses the work of his kingdom, may we rejoice and give glory to him. It's interesting, by the way, to see that Saul was not successful in his attempt to eliminate David. Twice in, in chapter 18 and uh, once in chapter 19, Saul throws his spear at David, but David manages to evade him. He asks a, a bride price of David, which will lead him into danger at the hands of the Philistines. But the Lord preserves David's life and enables him to give twice the bride price. When Saul actively moves against David to kill him. His own children, Jonathan and Mitchell, um, stand up against him. And uh, in, in order to protect David, when he sends messengers to arrest David, they're overcome by the Spirit of God. Even when he goes himself, he is so overwhelmed by the Spirit of God that he's unable to lay hands on David. The word escape is used five times in chapter 19 as God sovereignly helps David to evade Saul's attacks. All this should have shown Saul that God was with David. It was and it is the height of folly to fight against God's purposes. And in his better moments, Saul knew that. And yet, for the most part, his heart was filled with hatred and set on killing David. <coughs> May the Lord free us from such corrosive jealousy in our lives.
May he help us to genuinely rejoice in the blessing of all his servants who are used mightily to bring him glory. So secondly, we've seen Saul's hatred and jealousy. And now lastly, we see Jonathan's great love and loyalty. Back to chapter 18 and the aftermath of David's great victory against Goliath. Verse 1. As soon as, John, as soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Jonathan, a, a great warrior himself, recognises in David a kindred spirit and strikes up a deep friendship with him. So strong and intimate was their friendship that, you know, the, the gay Christian movement have repeatedly claimed it was an example of a gay relationship in the Bible. But there are several things that should be noted. Firstly, Firstly, everyone loved David. Chapter 18, verse 16. All Israel and Judah loved David. And it's the same word. Uh, verse 22, Saul's servants loved David. Verse 20, Saul's daughter Mitchell loved him. And back in chapter 16, verse 21, we're even told that Saul loved him greatly before his later jealousy developed. So love for David was not unique to Jonathan. It seems that David was a charismatic figure in both senses of the word, word who inspired love and loyalty from many around him. It's true that Jonathan's love for David seems particularly intense. Several times we're told that Jonathan loved him as his own soul. 18, chapter 18, verse 1, chapter 20, verse 17. At the end of chapter 20, they kiss one another. But then this is the traditional sign of greeting and friendship, just as Judas falsely kissed Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. <coughs> and we know that David had several wives and concubines, not to mention children, and that his later lust for Bathsheba drew him into terrible sin. So the charge of being gay seems way off target. But most of all, I think this accusation dishon dishonours David and Jonathan in believing them incapable of this kind of close friendship without it entailing sexual love. Close friendships between men certainly exist without implying homosexuality, not least between brothers in arms. As Proverbs 18 verse 24 says, there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Well, as a, a result of this close friendship, we're told that Jonathan made a covenant with David, even giving him his robes, armour and weapons. Here the, the crown prince generously acknowledges the humble shepherd who has conquered Goliath and strikes up an alliance which will be crucial to David's survival at court. He greatly admires David's courage and godly character and pledges loyalty to his friend. It may be that Jonathan was simply providing David with the accoutrements that he would need at court, yet in giving him the symbols of his princely status, it's hard to avoid the conclusion that, that already Jonathan recognises at some level that David, not himself, will be Israel's next king. Succession to the throne is, is Jonathan's natural right, Yet here it seems that he freely and gladly relinquishes it in David's favour. Certainly in chapter 20, verses 14 to 15, he recognises that David will one day become king and seeks mercy for his own family when that day comes. And later in 2 Samuel, we see that happening, um, where, where David um, treats Mephibosheth with great race but I think there's, there's, there's more of a friendship here, great friendship here it seems that Jonathan recognises the grace of God at work in David he's God's chosen king and Jonathan is willing to acknowledge him 
In chapter 20, verse 31, Saul berates him for his foolish loyalty to David. He says, as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Saul emphasises you and your kingdom. But Jonathan, uh, sorry, but Jonathan puts God's kingdom first, just as Jesus teaches in Matthew 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He shares the attitude of John the Baptist in John 3, verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. He's willing to um, put David before himself because he, because he can see that God is at work in him um, and that he is God's anointed one. And so he's willing to uh, devise the ruse with uh, the boy and the arrows to let David know that he must flee Saul's wrath. So at last we see David and Jonathan making their tearful farewell at the end of chapter 20. Jonathan could have taken action himself against David as a potential rival for the throne, but he willingly supported him as God's rightful king. I wonder, are we willing to seek God's kingdom first, to surrender our own rights if God may thereby be glorified? In one of his books, Alan Redpath says, before we can pray, thy kingdom come, we must be willing to pray, my kingdom go. Surrendering control of our own lives to the one who is our rightful king. And that could be hard. It could be hard to let go of, of the desires of our own heart. Um, but we, sh but we should be willing to do that if we're saying, thy kingdom come. May the Lord help us to, to give him his rightful place on the throne of our lives. So we've seen two widely differing attitudes, hatred and jealousy, love and loyalty, all inspired by the same person, David, Israel's champion, soon to be her greatest king. But David points forward to his even greater descendant, Jesus Christ, the ultimate anointed one. Like David, he won favour with men. Mark 7 verse 37 says, They were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. And yet all too soon he aroused jealousy and opposition. He was harried and persecuted, ultimately going to the cross for us men and our salvation and three days later he rose again showing himself to be our true king he's our mighty champion who's defeated sin the death death and the devil on behalf of God's people so I wonder how you will respond to him it's possible to respond with unreasoning hatred Rejecting God's ways as Saul did so tragically. Or by God's grace, we can own him as our king. Recognise him as your saviour and the Lord of your life. Let's put to death any envy or jealousy of how God should choose to work in the lives of others and let's be willing to seek his kingdom first in all things <coughs> and as we walk with him we can know that the Lord is with us in every situation thank you Lord Amen